We'll begin this study by turning in our King James Bibles to the book of Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8. I'm going to be proving to you today that there is a Masonic conspiracy against this King James Bible. And I will be showing you the proof of it. But we need to start, start in Colossians chapter 2 verse 8 to get a good um, footing for this study. The Bible says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Perfect way to start this study because that verse condemned the man that wrote this book right here. Manly P. Hall, one of uh, Freemasonry's greatest scholars, um, an esoteric um, practitioner, expert, whatever else in philosophical uh, writings. Okay, I'm going to try to be as nice as I can in this study, but I get a little bit irritated and I call devils what they are. If some guy's a devil, then I'm going to call him out on that. But I'm going to show you in this book, which was written before a lot of the modern versions, the popular modern versions of today, um, were written. And ironically, the philosophy espoused in here, um, and I do mean philosophy, um, it goes into these new versions. And this philosophy here is what most modern Christians believe. I'm going to be showing you the proof of that today. So I have an overhead camera over here. I'm going to be showing it up close with this document camera. All right, here we have How to Understand Your Bible, A Philosopher's Interpretation of Obscure and Puzzling Passages. So again, I'm not being sarcastic or mean-spirited. He himself admits that he is a philosopher. Okay, so now let me zoom in here a little bit on this. There you can see it in greater detail. And we're going to start out in page on page 163 here in the back. Page 163. Let me get zoomed in as much as I can here so we can really read the text well. I don't have my remote control right now, so I have to do this by hand. Have to find the thing first. Okay. He says here on page 163, examine several editions of the Christian Bible as, for example, compare the King James Version with the modern revised edition. What he's talking about there is the 1881 edition, which I have here in my collection. Um, just get that real, grab that real quickly here. It's up here. When he says about the modern revised edition he's talking about this the revised version of 1881 this is a original copy not a reprint um had this thing for quite a few years so right there it is that's what he's talking about okay let's get back to this here uh with the modern revised edition and a recent publication the bible as living literature consider the polyglots a get and get a parallel greek english text isn't that what most Christians tell you? They'll say, oh, you need to get a parallel Greek-English text. Why? The work's already done to produce this. You're not going to do better than they did. You will make many interesting discoveries. You will find that upon the skeleton of the Greek text has been built the beautiful version that we know, talking about the King James, you will discover numerous errors and alternative renderings and slowly recover from the infallibility complex from which so many Orthodox Bible readers seem to suffer. So you're suffering if you believe that the King James Bible is infallible. That might lead to some dogmatic beliefs and might actually lead to you getting saved. See, uh, Masonic Satanists don't want that. And I'm going to show you in a little bit that he actually says, just spells it right out, that his wisdom comes from Satan. He doesn't even mince words. Just It comes from Satan. And if you understand anything about what he said, his famous quote um, from, uh, I forget the name of the book, but it was one of his Masonic books, just outright Freemasonry. And he talked about the Master Mason, Mason having the seething energies of Lucifer at his command. 
And people say, well, you're taking it out of context. What? Oh, I'm going to show you in this book that he wrote, I'm going to show you that he says that his wisdom comes from Satan. So what was Satan? What did he say back there in the Garden of Eden? He said, yea, hath God said, question God's word is what he did. Isn't that what he just wrote right there? It's exactly what he just wrote. Let's get back to it. Read the Vulgate, the Septuagint, and get a good dictionary of English Hebrew terms. These will all pr prove valuable. They will not destroy your faith in the Bible, uh, but they may injure your faith in some of its translators. You will see the usefulness of picking phrases to pieces and trying to think in terms of jots and tittles. You'll be free to consider the larger issues, which he discusses in this whole thing, trying to combine philosophy with the Bible. The Christian Bible as we know it today is a fragment of the Christian traditions of the 1st and 2nd centuries. This fragment was arbitrarily preserved and the rest destroyed. It's not true. Politics and policy played a large part in, its, in the compilation. Still, with all its faults and with all its misinterpretations, the Christian Bible is the greatest book in English literature. But like most other great books, it must be approached with understanding, gentleness, impersonality, in other words, uh, God didn't inspire it. And a sincere, des sincere desire to find truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Oh, no, not according to this. So you see, this is the philosophy that most Christians have right now. And if you ask them, where did you get it from? They're not Freemasons. Well, some might not be, but a lot of them, they're not Freemasons, but they've been told and they've heard and they, my pastor said and my professor said and the guy I listened to and you know, and where does the philosophy come from? This was written back in 19, I said 48 in another video. I was wrong. It's 1942. All right. Let me show you where it was or when it was written, the year it was written. Copyright 1942 by Manley Palmer Hall, all rights reserved. Right there you go. So in 1942, a Masonic philosopher writes this, and within a few decades, it's practiced by most Christians. And it's being repeated by most Christians. Hmm, I wonder why. You don't think it could be because uh, Freemasonry is infiltrating the Christian churches and a lot of the pastors are Freemasons, like the Southern Baptist Convention especially, and others, you know, as well. Um, you don't think that that could be the case? You don't think that the uh, church buildings, the whole desire to build these huge big temples came from Freemasonry and a lot of church buildings actually were built by Freemasons? Um, no, nothing like that. There couldn't be any kind of conspiracy within the church. Never. <laughs> yeah, let's go to page 147 next. Open your mind a little bit here. Here we have page 147. There are abundant indications of philosophical footings in the Christian religion. What is necessary is a general reform, new and complete translations of the Bible... Huh, with various possible alternative renderings from the earliest Greek manuscripts, an admission that much is not known and not knowable, and most of all, an attempt to re reconcile Christianity with the great philosophies of the ancient and modern worlds, rather than the preservation of an attitude of isolation. <laughs> Whoo, unpack a lot of things from that one. Um, an attitude of isolation. There is none other name under heaven given among men whereby, whereby we must be saved. Jesus saith unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Oh, no, no, we have to just, we can't take that literally. It has to be philosophical. Jesus was speaking philosophically because certainly he wouldn't uh, just exclude all other faith traditions but his own. See, that's what a man that serves Satan would say. But how do you like that thing there? What is necessary is a general reform, new and complete translations of the Bible written in 1942, before the New American Standard Version came out, before the Revised Standard Version came out, before the NIV, the ESV, the New King James Version, the Today's Living uh, Bible, all these Bible versions. Huh. And it's a 
from the earliest Greek manuscripts, the ones that uh, David Daniels wrote about in his excellent work on uh, is the world's oldest Bible a fake? And he proved that it is. Sinaiticus, written by Constantine Simonides and uh, basically taken and made famous by Constantine von Tischendorf. And in the book, Manly Palmer Hall, David Daniels gives a quote. I showed it in my other study. He gives a quote and he says that for 100 years, he wrote this in 1944 and 1844 is when Constantine von Tischendorf came out with the Sinaiticus. Oh, the great discovery. And he said, for 100 years, we've been trying to replace the King James Bible. And people say, oh, you know, David Daniels, he just took that out of context. It, there's really no other proof for that. I just showed it to you. Right here in this satanic book by this very satanic philosopher, Manly Palmer Hall. Just showed it to you. What is necessary is a general reform, new and complete translations of the Bible with possible alternative renderings from the early Greek, earliest Greek manuscripts. Hmm. So even your new King James Version, you look at it and it says in the footnote, not in the best oldest manuscripts. It reads similar to the King James Bible in many places, but then it in the footnote. Alternative reading could be. Some manuscripts omit. This should be that way. That should be this way. Huh. The new King James Version that came out originally with the Trichetra on the front. Symbol for the pagan trinity. Hmm. Very interesting. You say, but you know, this whole new translation thing, there's, eh, come on. That's, there's no tie in here. Really? Here we have the Nestle's 27th edition. Right there. Let me show it to you. Nestle Aland, right here. Where's the edition? 27. Okay. Let's go here to the introduction. You can see it there. I've showed this in many studies, but I'll do it one more time. The text shared by these two editions was adopted internationally by Bible societies and following an agreement between the Vatican and the United Bible Societies, it has served as the basis for new translations New and complete translations of the Bible? Why do you have an occultist, Satan worshiper, saying the same thing It's here in the Nestle Alon text? Interesting. And for revisions made under their supervisions. Okay? You can pause it and read the rest of it there if you want to. We're not going to go through all the rest of that, but you can see it. What do I know? I'm just kind of a dumb hillbilly. I don't have much of that education. Second Vatican Council. Let me show you what this says. Here it is. This is page uh, 112. But since the word of God must be readily available at all times, the church with motherly concern sees to it that suitable and correct translations are made into various languages, especially from the original texts of the sacred books. Notice the ancient manuscripts. If when the opportunity presents itself and the authorities of the church agree, these translations are made jointly with churches separated from us, they can then be used by all Christians. Huh. Seems a little odd, doesn't it? But you have no proof, Brian. You you're you mean well. You're a little dumb, but you know you mean well. But you didn't show any proof of this actually happening. I will be. I haven't up to this point, but I will be right now. Okay. Here we have the NIV story by Burton L. Goddard. And let's get back here to where my little bookmark is at. Yeah, I, I like to put that in these uh books that are satanic like this. Warning, this book is satanic. It is to be used for documentation purposes only. When I go home to be with the Lord, I don't want this falling into the wrong hands of people thinking it was actually real, that I actually thought it was good. 
The magic of summers in Europe is indeed getting the job done. So the pattern continues. In 1976, the scene is the Collegio Mayor Montalieno, a residential unit of the University of Salamanca, fourth oldest university in Europe. An order of Catholic nuns operates the residence, and affectionate ties of Christian love soon bind the hearts of all together in a marvelous way. The NIV was partly translated at a Roman Catholic uh, university. The one, by the way, University of Salamanca, was, was where uh, Ignatius de Loyola, founder of the Jesuit order, um, and that's the right way to say it, by the way, it's Ignatius, if you understand the, Spat the Spanish language. Uh, it's not Ignatius, that's an American way to say it. But try to be thorough in what I say, in other words. Uh, how do you explain that? Christian love? Huh. Uh, these translations can be made and used by Christians of all different ones, even churches separated from us. Second Vatican Council. Hmm. Made under their supervision, Nestle's 27th said. But it goes in here, the summers in Europe, talking about the NIV and everything being uh, you know, produced here. The summers in Europe make it possible for a collegiate translation to be produced within a relatively short span of time. In the process, they enrich the lives of translators and their families in a remarkable way in areas of history, culture, and scenic beauty. But more, they provide a practical day-by-day -day ecumenical experience beyond compare. And then you can read, you know, Baptists and pedo-Baptists. Well, that might have more of a <laughs> hidden meaning to it than you might realize there. You know, to get the little pedo thing there. Um, you could file, make a file about the pedos, if you understand what I'm saying there. So, um, hmm. So, 1942, 1942, we need to make completely new translations. The 1960s, we need to make new translations with separated brethren. In the 1970s, we're over making translations at a Catholic university. The newest Dessel's text. We need to uh, continue to make these new translations under the Vatican supervision. But there's no conspiracy. <laughs> you new version, wicked using, you, people that use these wicked modern versions, you, you wicked people that always try to tear down the King James Bible in my comment section. May the Lord rebuke every one of you wicked people. Servants of the devil. So you can't, you can't handle the truth that comes out on this channel. That's why all that you can do, like a bunch of stupid atheists, you claim to be Christians, and yet you come out and you attack the book. You attack God's book. Get ready for your eternity in, in hell. Okay, It's not going to be in heaven. See, you know, there's supposed to be righteous indignation when we deal with a subject like this. This book has been the most blessed book ever. Even stupid idiot here had to say it's the greatest work of English literature, which I've said for years. Okay, that is a scientifically verifiable fact. That's not my opinion. It's not his opinion. It's a fact. The greatest book that ever showed up on this earth is this King James Bible. What right do you have, stupid out there, trying to tear it down? Oh, you know more than the guys that, you know, 54 translators that spent seven years. You know, 54 at the beginning, 47 till the thing was done because a few died, they were older men. But you know more. Some, some jerk in the comment section, oh, my, I have a computer software and I have a Greek English lexicon. Oh, very good. Just like your uh, philosopher here told you to do. Get a Greek English lexicon or a Hebrew English type of thing and then you can go through and pick apart. Well, actually, that shouldn't be translated in there. Then this shouldn't be translated and that shouldn't be translated. Uh-huh. You're a Satanist. You understand? Your little philosopher here gets his wisdom from Satan. He passed it on to you, and you're repeating what he's saying. No Bible-believing Christian goes around saying, well, the Bible says, well, actually, it doesn't really say that because a better translation would be, and actually, if you understand, you know, I mean, go, go up to witness to somebody. See, this, this is the whole issue with the Bible version issue. This is the whole thing. Go up to witness to somebody and you say, I'd like to tell you how to get to heaven. They say, how do I do that? How do I know for sure? Well, I can read to you from this book, but quite frankly, it's filled with errors. Um, would you like to know how to be saved? They'd say, well, if it's filled with errors, how can I trust anything from it? 
well, you can trust me because I've been studying Greek and Hebrew. Well, is your Greek and Hebrew uh, perfect? Well, no. Only the original autographs, we lost those. So, uh, no. Well, can you uh, tell me any Bible that's perfect? I mean, since you can point out the errors in this book right here, can you correct the errors and then give me a perfect book? No. <laughs> it's not possible. I can, this isn't perfect, and I can show you why it's not perfect, but I can't fix the errors in it to give you a perfect book. <laughs> See, it's a philosophical problem. That's the whole thing. And there are brand new saved Christians or whatever else that might fall into, you know, they go to a Bible store, I need a Bible, to, and some devil there sells them a, a new version. And they come home, they're thinking, this is God's book. I used to believe that my NIV was perfect. And I'd get professing Christians, they'd say, there's no such thing as a perfect Bible. And I used to think to myself, okay, then how can you claim to be a Christian? There's no perfect Bible. Only the original autographs were perfect. Can I see those? No, we don't have them anymore. Okay, then you're lost. You have no way to get to heaven if you have no faith that there's a perfect Bible out there. Spoiled by philosophy much? Let's continue. And, you know, if you're upset about the attitude, then you're already gone. Okay, just go watch something else. Page 83. I mean, this ought to get your blood pressure going. It should make you angry when you think about Christians that were persecuted and Christians that were put to death to have the Word of God in our language. How many Christians had to die before we get that King James Bible? I'm just supposed to let a bunch of wicked people come along and take it from me while professing to be Christians. Page 83. The oldest existing codices, Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, which is a total lie, they're not, of the New Testament reveal considerable change and amendment. The, yeah, I'd think it because it was a rough draft that Constantine Simonides brought out. It wasn't even finished yet before Constantine von Tischendorf took it and ran with it, promoted it. The King James Version omits a number of passages of a controversial nature. No, it doesn't. The other ones add to the scriptures. Particularly such as would cause doubt to arise concerning the uniqueness or the infallibility of the Christian faith. The King James Bible was, first, was published first in 1611 under the patronage of James I of England. The actual translations were made by a number of scholars from leading universities. They were elderly men, many of whom died before the book of Psalms was reached. The work was undertaken during the most corrupt period of English <laughs> uh, here we go. education. The principal university records of the time consist of the amount of beer drunk by the student body. There is a story possibly apocryphal, but with a ring of truth about it, huh? <laughs> that King James's final instructor, instructions to the translators were in substance as follows. Where the new translations agree with accepted tradition, use them. Where they do not, conform to the popular tradition. Okay? Just hold on there. Um, oh, oh, this is shaking my faith. It shouldn't. You know why? He, provo he provided no proof. A man that gets his wisdom from Satan, I'll be showing you that here in a minute, and he didn't give any footnote. He didn't give any historical quote to this. It's just, this is the way it is. You can trust me because I'm a satanic philosopher. See, I wouldn't possibly lie to you, even though I don't believe lying is wrong. But, you know, you can believe me. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> sure, yeah. You know, uh, let's just have Satan come over for a, a meal here and we'll have, sit around and talk about truth or something. You know, sure. But uh, look at this little beauty coming up here. How many times I've had to deal with this in the comment section? Uh, quote here, when the manuscript was completed, it was given into the hands of Lord Bacon, who was responsible for its present literary excellence. He achieved the impressiveness now evident in the book largely by taking liberties with the text. As a result, the Bible student is not justified in accepting the King James Version as an infallible production or in believing that the divine dictates were revealed originally in the King's English. <laughs> All you dumb little morons out there that fall for this stuff, where's the proof? He didn't give any uh, historical quotations. Uh, I can find it in this book. Or, oh, it's just he made it up. And this has been repeated and repeated and repeated. And, you know, the old uh, 
Edward Bernays propaganda, you know, points of uh, you repeat it long enough, loud enough, you know, and uh, often enough, and the people eventually believe it. It's called propaganda. Okay, there's no proof, none. Okay, Lord Bacon, uh, he's the one that did it. No, he isn't. Okay, and the reason that you can tell that is because there have been plenty of scholars since then that can compare the Textus Receptus with the King James Bible, and they've said it's the best translation ever. So he oh, he took certain liberties. Well, no, he didn't. Provides no proof at all. And yet you get internet idiots out there, and they'll repeat this thing. Oh, it was actually you know, the, and you have to put a scary soundtrack behind it. Dun, da, dun, da, 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 da. You know what most Christians don't understand is that Lord Bacon is the real author of the King. Shut up. <laughs> you got it from a Masonic philosopher that showed no proof. <laughs> uh, let's see. Let's continue here. Okay. Here I'm going to actually show you the where he talks about getting his wisdom from Satan. And he gets this teaching from the Talmud, by the way. A lot of these Talmudic uh, rabbis, these Jews, you know, the little Pope's Jews, the papal Yudin, we like to call them. Um, they go to the Talmud and they get this whole thing of there's, there's only goodness in the universe. There's no such thing as bad or evil. And it's all just, you know, balancing and, and it's all yin and yang and whatever else. <laughs> yeah. They don't understand the Bible. But let's look at this. We have page 81. Here we go. He says, Satan is not a spirit of destruction. There is no essential evil in the universe. Our present form of the devil is merely derived from the Greek nature god Pan. As Goethe says, Mephistopheles or Satan is part of the power that still works for good while ever scheming ill. Satan, look at this, is really karma. But he is more than that. <laughs> oh, looks like karma got him. Oh, you mean Satan? Where'd you, I mean, again, this guy, you know, there's a some kind of metaphysical um, museum or something like that out, I think in San Francisco, I think is where he was at. Um, and they celebrate this guy. I mean, he was this great philosopher. He just said karma is Satan. So when you say, oh, people got paid back for what they did, it's karma. You're actually saying it's Satan. His words, his words, not, I'm not trying to exaggerate or put the guy down or whatever else in terms of, you know, this whole thing. He wrote it, not me. Let's get back to it here. Continuing, it says, he is that temptation from which arises strength. <laughs> strength comes from temptation. Okay. God will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able to bear. Well, will with the temptation make a way out, but not apparently here. You know, he is that temptation from which arises strength. Okay? Weakness is where you get your strength because you rely on the Lord, unless you're a devil like this. When the mysteries were celebrated in ancient Egypt, there was an evil spirit called Typhon or Set who brought about the death of the good Osiris. It is the red set that has given us our concept of the devil, but Set was nothing but the material world, the ground of man's temptation, and also the environment in which he gains immortality through self discipline. Therefore, set or Satan is divine opportunity, the world into which we come in ignorance, but from which we depart in wisdom. It is the obstacle that is ever building strength. It is that whole field of difficulty which, which overcome makes us masters of our own life. And I have here written, ye can be as gods. Look at that. Makes us master of our own life. <laughs> Genesis chapter 3, people, that's what you're seeing there. But he is saying right here that his wisdom comes from Satan. That's what he's saying. So you can trust this guy. Don't worry. Satan is a liar. He's the father of lies. Jesus Christ talked about that. But, uh, hey, he's not the father of lies anymore. He gives you wisdom. He had wisdom to be a liar. I mean, again, um, <clears throat> you know, the mysteries were celebrated in ancient Egypt. There was an evil spirit called Typhon or Set, which brought about the death of the good Osiris. Uh, okay, uh, book, chapter, verse, please. Page number, paragraph, anything? Uh, no, no. Um, I said about this in the live stream, I think I did yesterday, 
that uh, I was getting into some of the Jordan Maxwell thing. I had heard about it, not getting into it, but I was, I heard some of the stuff and I thought, okay, America's the new Atlantis. It's kind of that rose out of the ashes and, and it's, you know, the sea and, and there's all these other things that are occult type of stuff. And I thought, I mean, I'm a researcher. So I was watching this one video and they were talking about all these quotes and I was taking notes, you know, extensive notes on it and everything. I don't have my notebook here right now, but I was taking notes and I thought, oh, this is interesting, you know, seeing how the occult people in the government have, you know, set up the, the uh, financial system and whatever else to control people. I was trying to figure it out, you know, going to bring out a study on it. And after a while, I thought, paused the video and I thought, you know what? He's not giving any proof for any of this. All right. No, no proof at all. This Jordan Maxwell guy. And I've seen other things he's done and, you know, oh, there are other books in the Bible. There's, there's uh, other revelations and other this and there's that. And, and I'm, uh, uh, hold on, excuse me. Uh, where are you getting this from? Well, see, because uh, makes us master of our own life. Satan makes you master of your own life. You can just kind of create it. You just take a bunch of different things and you say, well, um, I just got a revelation. Yeah, from the devil. Uh, this revelation came to me and this, this divine light came upon me and, and I, it's so clear now in my mind and I'm just going to write it like it's fact. Well, can you please provide the proof for it? I don't need to. It's right there. See, here's the thing. Um, I believe, Brian Denlinger, that you, I, I believe your heart's in the right place, but you're wrong. Okay. You know how you proved me wrong? Right there. This is my standard. I do not have opinions and whatever else that matter. Um, my opinions can fail. The scriptures don't fail. I will point you, the viewer, to the scriptures every single time. Traditions of men, uh, feelings, emotions, name it. It doesn't matter. What saith the scriptures? Well, but we have to check with the Vatican Council. We have to go to the Nessel Aland text here. Uh, no, you don't need any of that junk. You need the, the Bible. What do the scriptures say? And then you can judge me and I can judge you according to the scriptures. Iron sharpening iron. The sword of the spirit. Logical. Makes sense. Well, our faith tradition says it doesn't agree with your faith tradition. Okay. Uh, and how do I know which one is right? You get that, you know, lost people. Well, there's this person believes this and that person believes this and, and everything. Well, which one is right? Well, if you have no objective standard, you're correct in that. You just get philosophical and we all have our own truth and there is no actual absolute truth. And we all just, you know, we're all parts of the divine whole and we all, you know, God, we see God in all things. And it, uh, Or if you have an objective standard, you can say, okay, that's the standard. You know, you take out a manual, owner's manual for a vehicle, and one guy says the, the uh, lug nuts should be torqued, uh, I'm just going to make up a number, uh, 70 pounds or something, uh, you know, with your torque wrench. Um, another guy says, I think it should be 90. You look at the manual and it says 80. Well, but he says he feels it's 70, this guy feels it's 90. Doesn't matter. It's 80. Why? The manual said so. The guys that built the car said 80. Right in the comments, oh, you're, you're 80 would be too high. Oh, whatever. I just made up a bunch of numbers. Tried to prove a point here. But let's continue. Um, page 142 and 143. All right. Here we have page 142. Okay. To Peter, the Christian mystery was that of God made flesh. To Paul, it was flesh made God. <laughs> okay. All men can become gods. You can be as gods. That's not what Paul taught. These two could never mingle their interpretations into a common purpose. Huh? And it is recorded in the early writings that Paul visited Peter, but Peter refused to see him. And I've written Galatians 1.18. Let's go there in your King James Bible. Galatians 1.18. Peter refused to see Paul. Paul tried to make, you know, amends and things with, with Peter because Paul was a scholar. He, well, no, he was a philosopher. And even though he condemned philosophy in Colossians 2.8, but that was 
um, just he wasn't really condemning. He was, you know, yeah. <laughs> um, so Paul, with his philosophical wisdom, was coming and trying to speak down. He wanted to debate uh, Peter, right? Galatians chapter 1 and verse 18. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. Oops. Oh, oops. Yeah, uh, the book here says that, um, this book says that uh, Paul, in the early writings that Paul visited Peter, but Peter refused to see him. This one says that uh, they went up and they spent 15 days together. You know, oh, maybe Manly Palmer Hall, the satanic idiot that he is, maybe, you know, he, you know, he saw in a vision that when Paul was there for 15 days, Paul was trying to talk to him. Peter for 15 days was going, I don't see you. I don't see you. I'm not listening. I'm not listening. <laughs> maybe just running away or something. Why bother... Uh, you know, taking stands for the truth. You just kind of make it up as you go, <laughs> like a good con man. All right, back to the nutty book here. All right, down here we have, it is proper to study history, but not proper to worship it. The Christian Bible is a semi-historical account, huh? Of certain possible happenings. <laughs> Boy, thank you for opening your mind there, wicked devil. Certain possible happenings which in themselves are not necessarily the appropriate foundation for a faith. Okay. Nor does this history or neo-history, or in some cases outright fiction, ensure salvation by the reading of or acceptance of it. This is the error of the ages. In a desperate effort to preserve the letter of the law, we have committed grievous errors in the name of truth. <laughs> I'm going to just, uh, let me explain this from the most scholarly way that I can possibly do this. Okay. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Welcome to Nuttyville. Okay? It's not actually truth, but we have to understand it in such a way that we realize the truth of it. Okay, yeah, you know. And remember, this is written, this crap is written in 1942. This garbage. And yet, this exact philosophy is what underlies the new versions and the modern churches. You go up to the average modern Christian, you say, do you believe that this book is the perfect written word of God, inspired and errant, infallible? Do you believe that this is, represents pure history, everything? Well, I, I don't know. Maybe I think some parts are true. Other parts might not be. <laughs> Where did they get it from? A philosopher, a Masonic Satan worshiping philosopher. Is your blood boiling? Are you angry? Check your pulse. Okay, if it's not beating a little faster than normal right now, you probably want to get saved. You should love that book so much that people attack it like this devil right here and all these modern wicked churches. It should tick you off. I mean, you people need to check yourself. You see, you only have one chance at this. Only one life. You mess it up with your dead religion. You wander out of the way of understanding you remain in the congregation of the dead. The Bible says that. You mess it up with your nonchalant, well, you know, I don't think I'd have the attitude. I think you're driving some people away with your attitude, right? Do you realize what happens if you mess up and you get the whole way through your life faking it till you make it. And all of a sudden you realize you stand before Jesus Christ, you die, and he says, Depart from me, ye cursed. I never knew you. Oh, whoa, hold on. What? And you look down into the hell and you hear the screams and everything. And, hold on. I, I should get another chance here. I mean, if you're a just loving God and whatever, my, ju my justice and everything and my love manifested Calvary. You rejected that. You rejected my word. Went the whole way through your life with your own philosophies. Depart from me. And you're upset about a preacher. Yelling and getting upset about things. <sighs> you're disgusting. A lot of these people. Page 
page 66. Let's go to the next satanic quote from this devil. You know, and the whole thing, go get the book. You want to say, let's, I'm going to bring this out in a way that, you know, it's not as radical as Denlinger and he's, you know, angry and whatever else. If I had a pulpit right now, I'd be pounding it. You want to do it some kind of scholarly way and nice and smiling and whatever. Okay, then go get this book and use the quotes. All right. You don't have to accept the way I say it or whatever else. I'm not your God. All right. Uh, go get the book and show these new versionists where their philosophy a philosopher's interpretation of obscure and puzzling passages. Show them where it comes from. And isn't it funny because the new versions, what's the reason that they want to get rid of the King James? Because it's obscure and puzzling. It's archaic. We can't understand it anymore. Where did the philosophy come from? I'm reading out of it. And thank you, brother, for sending me this book. I'd have never found this. I never even knew that this thing was existed. Dear friend of the ministry sent me that. He also sent me a number of other books here. Horizon, the magazine of useful and intelligent living. June 1942, articles by Manley Palmer Hall, philosopher. Haven't even had time to go through that one or this one. This is spring 1944. Same thing. Here's another one, spring 1946. Friend of the ministry sends us this stuff. It's amazing. Thank the Lord for him. Here's another article that he sent us. Manly Palmer Hall. Another one here. And uh, this thing here that was along with it. The Quarter Cent Centenary. The Worshipful Company of Stationers and Newspaper Makers. Um, 1957. So, I have proof for what I'm saying. I'm not just a ranting, angry nut. I mean, I'm that, but I'm more than that, too. Page 66. Okay. Uh, it talks about here, what does this mean to the average Bible student? The enthusiastic jot and tittle worshiper will insist that the words of the King James Version are the very words of God himself. Amen, that's what I believe, and teach. The beginning of blasphemy seems to be to doubt the wisdom of that de decrepit group of old men who made the translation. Okay, a little bit of prejudice there. Time and time again, you run against these mistakes and every statement contained in the Bible should be checked with the Greek or Hebrew originals before any interpretation is derived therefrom. The Greek and Hebrew originals. Deal with any new versionist. You should really go back to the Greek and Hebrew originals. Why? <laughs> Doesn't make any sense. I went out and I got a car. You shouldn't get a car. You should go reinvent the car. N no, this car has been proven. I read different reviews of it and everything. It's a good vehicle. It's been around for many years and been tested and proved and everything. I don't care. You need to go back to the original. Go back to create it yourself. Uh, and that's mild compared to the Word of God. Um, this book has been tested and proved. And uh, not all the translators of the King James Bible were older men, by the way. They were younger men. Brilliant scholars, the most brilliant scholars, I would argue, ever that ever lived. Unless you read from a satanic philosopher that doesn't footnote anything and it's all just coming from up here and whatever. But just the thing I want to get through with this video is how disturbing it is to see his philosophies written in 1942 being spoken by so many professing Christians. Very strange. Now let's go to page 30. And um, I'm actually going to show you here. I mean, that's a lot of that's already, you know, I'm showing you what he said about the new versions and the King James Version, attacking the King James Version. Which, again, for all you dummies out there that say that the King James Version is a Masonic Bible and whatever, then why is Masonry, Masonry's uh, leading philosopher attacking it? Seems a little weird, doesn't it? 
Uh, it's not a Masonic Bible. Okay, King James was not a sodomite. He was married. He had, I think it was seven children. Um, he wrote against sodomy. Um, all the other lies that come out against the King James Version. They've all been answered, but most people are too lazy to do anything with that. And you just want to convince yourself that there is no perfect absolute standard by which you are going to be judged, when in reality there is. Okay, but I'm going to show you how nuts this guy is. Okay, let's look at this. Here we have page 30. Let's go up here. In the most ancient writings, gives no footnote to what these are, Noah's Ark is not called a boat. Its name signifies some peculiar form of enclosure, a superior place to which men could go for refuge. The idea of a boat floating on the water was a poetic figure developed by later theologists. Uh, I mean, because the, the concept of a boat floating on water is just so hard to grasp. So, you know, later theologists had to give us the idea of a boat floating on water. Because none of us, none of us ever see boats floating on water. See, this is the way a philosopher works, all right? A way a, the con artist actually works. They come to you and they see that you're happy and you're healthy and whatever else, and they have to convince you that you're not happy and healthy and that you need their product. So, let's continue. Okay. It is merely a symbol of the spiritual world which survives the disintegration of the physical universe. Briefly, then, the Ark of Noah, with its three decks, represents the three parts of the divine sphere. The Ark is a miniature of the universe. Wow. So, uh, how do you work out the 40 days and 40 nights thing? <laughs> and build an Ark. So, uh, Noah built a divine sphere? <laughs> See, again, philosophy. Um, philosophy is not uh, science, real true science. Um, you would look and you would say, okay, now if I want to make this particular thing happen, I have to have a process by which to do this. Uh, well, if I try that, then that would cause a problem with this. Hmm. Yeah, if I add that chemical and this chemical, yeah, there'd be a, an explosion. Yeah, I can't do that. Okay, and I'll have to scrap that. See, the scientific method is a critical method. It is a method that you come in and you say, I would like to believe this is my answer, the solution to these problems, but I have to arrive there through failure. Okay, try an experiment. Okay, that didn't work. Scratch that. We can't do that. We've tried it. Go look at every different angle. Okay, yeah, that doesn't work. Scratch that. No good. Okay, now let's try this. Let's see what happens if we add some of this or some of that. But see, philosophy, you just come up with anything. And it can contradict, and you, you say it contradicts, and you say, we don't have all the answers yet. The only thing that I know is that I know nothing. Well, then what are you talking for? <laughs> if you don't know anything, then why are you talking? Continuing here. This one, it gets even better. You'll love this one. I just have to read this because it's fun. Page 31. To solve this problem, the Elohim, people going off me about that too, by the way. I think that's funny that he uses it. To solve this problem, the Elohim caused the substances of the deluge to flow first through the sphere of Gehenna and thus to descend as a blazing deluge upon the place beneath, destroying all things. From this account, it is evident that the ancient Jewish... Rabbins did not consider the deluge to have actually consisted of water, but the term water inferred cosmic substances. Okay. According to the see, these same Rabbins, the water of the deluge was both male and female. <laughs> okay. This was because part of the waters descended from above the firmament and part came up from the abyss. The two streams then mingled in Gehenna and flowed forth upon the temporal earth. The male and female waters are those described in the first chapters of Genesis as the waters which were above the firmament and the waters which were beneath the firmament. Now, I had to share this with my wife and son, and now my son is fully convinced. I've lost him to Manly P. Hall philosophy, and we'll get down, get ready to eat a meal, and he'll say, Father, do you want male or female water for supper to drink? <laughs> I mean, uh, Okay, yeah, um, all you scientists out there, H2O, um, 
now has to be H2O male or female, or I don't really know what molecules would be there to see if it's a male or a female. Or... See what I'm saying? Philosophy. You get this weird philosophical stuff, it doesn't line up with the laws of science. But people take this stuff seriously. And you'll uh, come to this guy for the philosophy of changing the King James Bible. If you're nuts in the head, you will. All right, finally, one more quote here from Nuttyville. Um, here we have the formation of the worlds. This is page seven. He says, quote, The second verse of Genesis states, And the earth was without form, and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Interpreted according to the mystical tradition, this would read, And the below, the passive aspect of being, was formless and devoid of manifested life, and darkness or oblivion filled the whole expanse. The spirits of Elohim moved, impregnated, uh, and enlivened the essences of the negative principle. Yeah, that's a lot easier to read. You know, the King James Bible, it's just too hard to understand there, you know. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And so, you, you know, uh, and, the, and the below, the passive aspect of being was formless and devoid of manifested life, and darkness of oblivion filled the whole expanse. The spirits of Elohim moved, impregnated, and enlivened the essences of the negative principle. Wow. Oh, it just brings tears to your eyes, doesn't it? <laughs> so, um... First Timothy chapter 6, in our beloved, perfect Word of God, King James Bible. <laughs> First Timothy chapter 6, verses 3 through 5. If any man teach otherwise, and consent not the wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh... Lost my spot. And to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. So, the choice is yours. Now that we have arrived at the end of the study, let me put this one in my right hand, okay? This one can go into the left. Either you could believe this book that millions of Christians have down through the centuries. Put your faith in what this book says. It'll never lead you wrong. I can promise you that. I've been doing it for many years now. This book has changed my life. Not the Greek or the Hebrew. Or you can put your faith in philosophy. You can start to say, well, I'll just be philosophical here, and I can say that all the new versions are good, and they're better translations than the King James Bible, even though the fruits that they've produced have been terribly, terrible and rotten. Um, and I'm just going to get, keep going with that, and I'll say, well, actually, the Greek word. You say, well, uh, do you use the Greek then to witness to people? No. I use a translation that has to be corrected by the Greek so that I can teach people that God's word is perfect in the originals, which we don't have. Okay, cuckoo bird, um, you want to go with this philosophy? This will lead you to hell. Why? Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Being born again, of corrupt, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God. Written scripture. We receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. This will lead you to hell. This is Satan's lie in the Garden of Eden. And like I said, oh, I don't appreciate the way you said it. Okay, then get this book for yourself. Put out a tract. Put it out in another thing or something. I just showed you the proof that a Satanist, a Satanic philosopher, probably the most revered Masonic philosopher in history, and he's coming out saying, we need to come out with new versions. I think we need to make new translations. And then I showed it to you in the Nestle's text that they're saying the same thing. Let's make it under the supervision of the Vatican. The NIV story, people, was made, the NIV was made under the supervision of the Vatican at a Catholic university, and the Second Vatican Council says, let's make translations jointly with separated brethren. It's all right in front of your face. There is a conspiracy to get rid of the Word of God.
Your soul is in peril. Do you understand? I just wish you could say it a different way. By good words and fair speech, they deceive the hearts of the simple. You want me to be a deceiver. I'm not a deceiver. I'm trying, if I could reach through there and grab your ears and just shake your head and just say, listen to me. I don't want you to go to hell. I want you to have faith in the scriptures, a higher standard on this earth than your own mind. Comfort of the scriptures. This cannot bring you comfort. This brings you insanity. Did I mention that his first wife committed suicide? What a successful man. Married to a woman she couldn't handle it. I don't know how she killed herself. Gun or pills or whatever. Else. Committed suicide. And you're going to listen to that guy. God help you. I pray that you take heed to what I've said. Some of you will. A lot of you won't. Because the road to hell is broad, and many there be which go in thereat. You want to uh, try to philosophize that away? Well, that's your problem. Um, I can't help you. You start putting a bunch of stuff, uh, attacks in the King, on the King James Bible in the comments, you're gone. <laughs> okay, it takes me a few seconds to just go, you're hide user from channel, you're finished, done. I don't have time for it. I want to build up people's faith in the Word of God and not let you tear it down. Okay? So that is going to be it. As always, thank you very much for watching. Um, and I've been having a lot of spiritual attacks, by the way, before this whole thing came out. So I know I'm on the right uh, track. And um, if you haven't learned it by now, your spiritual attacks just get me convinced that I'm on the right track, if I can say it that way. Um, you're not going to stop me. Only Jesus Christ can stop me. Okay? And everybody out there that was praying for me got me through it. Thank you for your prayers. Um, I need those more than anything else. So we'll see you in the next study.